Hello, and welcome to the latest in our environmental policy video series. In each of these collections of bite-sized videos, we'll be bringing environmental science insights into the world of policy in 10 minutes or less. Over the course of this series, we'll be confronting a profound reality. The decisions we make now will be historic ones, and they will decide the stories we tell to generations to come about the fight against climate change. Our video series on climate action and transformative change will revisit the institution's work ahead of the COP26 Climate Summit, delving into the details of our manifesto for transformative change and the 54 recommendations it sets out for global climate action, as well as the analysis and evidence to support them. As the series goes on, we will learn more about the ways in which climate change has been caused by complex interactions between social, economic and natural systems. We'll also learn how we can employ systems thinking approaches to achieve multiple benefits for the environment, society and the economy. In this video, we'll be discussing the significant risks and consequences already being caused by climate change and the ways we can adapt to become more resilient. There are already significant amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, so we need to adapt to climate change even as we work to mitigate its effects. When we talk about adaptation, we mean the actions we can take to prepare for the effects of climate change, which include flood risk, food insecurity, energy insecurity, extreme weather events, heat waves, and the potential effects of other climate vulnerabilities. These consequences are already a threat for everyone, though many countries and communities are facing far worse effects, so greater work will be needed to support vulnerable nations. However, we do not need to make a choice between adapting to climate change and mitigating its extent. In episode two on climate leadership, we discussed how we can take a systems approach. And in episode six, we talked about the multiple benefits we can secure by working with the natural world. With effective knowledge sharing, appropriate resources, and science-led solutions, long-term resilience can be embedded globally while also working to mitigate the risks of climate change by reducing emissions. Nature-based solutions are a great example. Including green areas in the development will provide soil for water to drain through, reducing the risk of flooding. At the same time, that green space provides habitats for biodiversity and can store carbon to keep it out of the atmosphere. Nature-based solutions are often low cost and make places more resilient than equivalent investments in infrastructure. In episodes six and seven, we learned about green infrastructure and how we can apply the circular economy to the buildings we produce. Both those approaches can also support adaptation by building considerations such as energy supply resilience, flood risk resilience, connectivity, and supply chain resilience into all new buildings. Where we can, we should use buildings which already exist instead of expanding urban areas. Unused properties should be repurposed as long as we can do so sustainably. Often, it's difficult to assign a value to the benefits of avoiding risks and becoming more resilient, but we cannot underestimate how important adaptation will be. We must take a long-term view that recognizes unavoidable risks in the future if we do not prepare now. Risk assessments will be crucial to establishing what different communities need, avoiding unintended consequences or further risks being created in other parts of the environment. In episode five, we talked about how co-production can help communities to identify risks, as well as the potential for benefits, such as carbon storage, air quality improvements, or social benefits, such as jobs and services. There is no one size fits all approach. So both communities and science need to be part of conversations about how to adapt. The ways we make food require transformative change to address climate change. At the same time, we can also improve our food security, nutrition, and biodiversity. Climate change will only put our food sources in greater risk, and global politics often leads to food becoming inaccessible. So we need to adapt our food habits now to prepare. The choices we make about what we eat have direct influence on how we use land, which can create challenges for our climate and habitats. Not all people can make significant changes to their diets, so we should give people more options when we can. Businesses may need to prioritize giving customers sustainable choices rather than the overall number of product choices available. And some products may be too unsustainable for the amount we currently produce. We also need to make our supply chains more resilient 
which will require us to ensure sustainability at every link in the chain. Individual farms may need to change their practices to protect natural systems such as soil, which are crucial for both mitigating climate change as well as adapting. At the same time, we must recognize that agriculture can give us land stewardship and benefits for the environment, as long as farmers are rewarded for taking an environmental approach. Rather than only rewarding quantity, we should subsidize farmers who support sustainability, resilience, healthy diets, soil health, and long-term food security. Despite how important adaptation and resilience are, they've received less attention and funding historically than efforts to mitigate carbon emissions. Both need to be fully funded, but much more needs to be done to fill the adaptation gap, including knowledge sharing between developing and developed countries to identify risks at an early stage. As we discussed in episode five, governments should help the development of skills and sustainable jobs. Implementing solutions to adaptation and resilience will create many jobs and opportunities. So we should increase support for these industries while improving access to climate literacy and sustainable thinking through further education, higher education, technical education, graduate programs, apprenticeships, lifelong learning, retraining, and peer-to-peer -peer learning. Adaptation also relies on science to give communities the tools they need to identify potential options and understand their consequences. Science has a key role to play in translating theoretical ideas about risk into what they really mean for communities. Creating a more resilient world will be a significant task, and we cannot slow the pace of our action to mitigate climate change either. So we must approach both adaptation and mitigation from the perspective of fundamental systems, such as transport. How can we transform the ways we travel? Can we fight climate change while better connecting ourselves and giving consumers more choices? And can innovative technology and fuel support change? We'll be answering those questions and more as we continue with this IES policy series on climate action and transformative change. But if you want to get an inside track on the answers, you can read all about it in our landmark Manifesto for Transformative Change, which is available on the IES website. If you want to support our work on science-led climate action, you can become an affiliate, or if you're a professional in the environmental sector working with science, consider becoming a member of the IES. You'll find a link to our Manifesto for Transformative Change in the details below, along with our social media and a link to the IES website. Make sure you follow us across platforms so that you're up to date with all of our latest events, videos, and CPD opportunities. And remember to like the video, share it with friends and colleagues, and let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. Join us again for another short video in our policy series on climate action and transformative change. But for now, thank you for watching and we'll see you soon.